Himmel, as always, has a lot going on. We have just started a new project in Kathmandu, partnering with Nepalese and German organizations to ensure that their fascinating Buddhist and Hindu manuscript heritage is preserved. We've begun a new partnership with the British Library's Endangered Archives Program to digitize the manuscripts of the great Omari Mosque in Gaza. So how much more endangered does cultural heritage get than in a place like that? We've just renewed our projects in the fabled desert city of Timbuktu, and meanwhile, of course, continuing the work we're doing in the Middle East, in Africa, in Europe, in South Asia. So our teams are on the ground, they're still busy, and meanwhile, our group back in Collegeville is working hard to make sure that all those things become accessible. We continue to develop our staff. Melissa Morton has now been with us for over a year as our Assistant Director for Strategic Initiatives. We've hired Joe Rogers as our Director of External Relations. On October 1st, we'll welcome Amalian Ali Diakite to be a Himmel staff member cataloging those manuscripts from Timbuktu and bringing the expertise of that distinctive West African Islamic tradition to the attention of scholars around the world through our V. Himmel platform, our digital library. And just today, we finalized the hire of a new metadata librarian, Catherine Walsh. That sounds like a really terminally boring position, metadata librarian, crucial to making sure that we can share our manuscripts with the world through our online platforms. So we have a lot going on. Lyndall has just given you a little preview of some of the exciting events ahead. And rather than go on in more detail about that, I'll simply refer you to our, did I just push the wrong button? No, there we go, thank you. There's a higher authority in the room. <laughs> I'll simply say, check out what we're doing online. Um, we have always, as always, information on Himmel.org. We have a new media site that we've designed for the Jefferson Lecture with lots of great material on it. And of course, we're expecting a little flurry of publicity about Himmel's work with relation to both the Jefferson Lecture and the event in the Twin Cities. And let me just underscore Lindell's invitation about that November 6th event. The point of it is to suggest to people in the Twin Cities that cultural heritage isn't just an issue somewhere else. It's an issue in our increasingly pluralistic and multicultural metropolitan area with growing communities of Somalis, historic Nepalese community, a very important uh, Tibetan community, a very historic African-American community. It's here, and there's cultural heritage here, which may not be the manuscripts that we digitize elsewhere, but it takes different forms, and it's equally important to preserve and to share it. So please do come out for that. But my main job tonight is not to talk about Himmel, because all the people in the room know about us and follow us. My main job is to say a word about our speaker this evening. So I had known of Mike Toth for a number of years. Our paths finally crossed six years ago, something like that in Cambridge, Islamic Manuscript Association meeting. We've since been together in Washington, where I had an unforgettable tour of the Air and Space Museum near Dulles Airport. So that's where the really cool stuff is. The one on the mall is okay, but the really cool stuff is there. And he'll show you a space shuttle and say, Dad worked on that, I did this. It was an amazing afternoon. We've been together in Philadelphia. We've been together finally in Collegeville. And it's been great to have Mike with us for a couple of days to see that Himmel is not just people like me he meets here and there, but there's a whole team of folks who are devoted to making these materials accessible. And then the particularly interesting project of ours he'll speak about this evening as part of his presentation on how multispectral imaging, the sort of best of scientific imaging techniques, can be applied to things around the world, including surprising discoveries in central Minnesota. Mike is a key member of an expanding network of professionals dedicated around the world to the preservation of cultural heritage and particularly to its digital perpetuation. And obviously, that is precisely what Himmel has always done. Microfilm preservation and perpetuation, now the same in digital media. 
He's also been a trusted advisor and project partner for Arcadia, which is, most of you know, is our principal funder based in London. And it's just wonderful to see this incredible kind of web build as people who are interested in the same things, coming at it from different directions, converge on important projects. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to welcome Mike Toth. Rather than reading your CV and talking about the things you've done already, I think I'll let you show them. Mike. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be in Collegeville uh, for the first time and to visit Himmel physically. I mean, we've all visited Himmel digital and uh, Colum Father Columba uh, and I have been in touch by email and uh, having met up at various points around the world, but to have time together and to meet not only the people at Himmel, but all of you is, is truly an honor. And uh, it's my pleasure uh, to be up here in Minnesota, and we're looking forward to seeing so many of you down in the, in the Washington, D.C. area. As Coloma noted, you know, everyone asks, you know, how did, how did we meet up or have we met up? And, and you think, you know, Columba meets with fascinating people all over the world, uh, works with uh, rare artifacts, and uh, works with uh, digital technology. Uh, in the same way, I'm fortunate enough to meet with some fascinating people around the world and work with some uh, advanced technology. But what we really uh, first got to spend time on and to focus on was this hunk of parchment, the Syriac Galen Palimpsis. And I'll discuss this further, but of course, as a Syriacist, Father Columba was uh, provided some uh, advice and guidance and I think was cited in a New York Times article on the, the scholarly study uh, of the, the undertext in this manuscript. Well, I brought Father Columba by the library, the private library, where this manuscript is held. And uh, so he was able to hold the object and to see the Syriac text in in its physical form on the parchment there. And then there's some incunables there and he saw those. But, uh, and so we were able to you know, look at the text, but what really kind of cemented the bond here was that helmet, which is in this photo being worn by John Young, who is the mission commander on Apollo 16. And this helmet was on display uh, in this library. And so we started, and it was like, oh, wow, look at this helmet. And, you know, we're able to flip little things and, and all that, which you can't do in a museum usually, you know. So, uh, so we started chatting about this, and, and, you know, he grew up in Houston with the Apollo program. I grew up in Central Florida with the Apollo program. And I am, as, as Columbus cited, I am the son of an aerospace engineer. My father worked on that Redstone missile and many others, including one that launched uh, this guy named Alan Shepard. He says, nothing focuses your mind. My father is also very tall. And he said this little short guy came up to him and said, hey, I'll be going up on this thing. And he said, whoa, that really focuses your work and you've got to do good work there. <laughs> so uh, so I, you know, I have a keen interest in the Apollo program. I was very fortunate, one of the, the wonderful things I've done had been privileged to work on many unique things is work on our space shuttle. This is the launch manifest that we all signed uh, after the launch. Uh, and so I was able to take my father as by the Dulles Air and Space and in the same way was able to take Father Columba there. And uh, so we started chatting about, you know, his two million miles going here and there and my million miles going here and there. And uh, so we, uh, we kind of bonded over, over aerospace. Uh, amidst the digitization and the manuscripts and, and uh, all that is, uh, has made our, our culture great. So what I do is a little, uh, a little further, uh, I don't want to say advanced, but uh, more involved technically uh, than what Himmel is doing with regard to the actual collection of the data. 
And what I do is, and I shouldn't say I, what we do, because I lead teams of people just as Father Colombo leads teams of people, uh, who uh, work with uh, technology from national security, from medicine, uh, from astrophysics. Uh, I should point out nepotism is alive and well, not just in Washington, D.C., because my sister, Dr. Cynthia Toth, uh, has uh, 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 enabled me to use some advanced uh, medical equipment, too. So, uh, but our, our goal, just like Himmel's, is to use the technology to support the sharing, uh, the open access, and the preservation of cultural heritage. And to, we provide new insights into this beyond what you can see with the human eye. We use the technology to allow you to see more uh, in the objects. Uh, and uh, sometimes uh, it's, uh, it tends to, to be in colors we're not used to, but it helps enhance the object to make it uh, visible um, in a case like this to uh, more, more people uh, around the world. Ultimately, in support of humanities, whether it's in, uh, in Paris uh, or in, uh, in the Folger uh, Shakespeare Theater or here at Himble, where uh, David uh, is uh, working on the Syriac text that I'll, I'll discuss further here. Um, and our goal is to just get the data out there and make it available. Uh, unlike uh, Himmel, where you have more of a mediated data access uh, with a website, our goal is to just put the data up there so that institutions such as Himmel can use that data, can make it available for scholars. Uh, and uh, we put the images up there, we put the metadata up there, the all-important metadata up there, uh, and make that available around the, the globe. And then others can make use of that, whether they're looking at the choir structure and, and how these, these, these manuscripts get bound together, or even just putting it up on Flickr. I mean, not all, not everyone accesses their, their data from a, you know, from a laptop or a desktop computer. Many people use a, you know, a small personal device. So however people want to use it, we do not, we, we try to make it available under a, a Creative Commons license that, that allows anyone to use it for any purpose. So another key part of this, and one of the reasons we focus on just the simple files is for digital preservation. So we use optical imaging, uh, which is to use the light, just like these bright lights here, uh, but to break them up into the different wavelengths, and I'll discuss that further, uh, to study uh, and to, uh, to reveal in uh, some text that may not be seen as here uh, with the human eye in the original manuscript. Um, now, we are subject to the laws of physics, magic and Harry Potter notwithstanding. Uh, there are limitations on this. Uh, we have certain energy levels we're able to use, um, working with the light that we see with our eye as well as light we don't see with our eye. Sometimes this doesn't work. Those, those laws of physics prevent us from going further. And then we have to work with different methods of, of utilizing that light. This is where medicine comes in. I won't speak much this evening about our use of what's called optical coherence tomography. My sister uses that to look at retinas. Some of you may have, whether it's macular degeneration or just a regular exam, uh, you have OCT, uh, optical coherence tomography of your retina. We've used that to look at different layers of papyrus uh, in mummy masks which sometimes contain old texts. Uh, I've got limited time, so I won't go in, in depth there. But uh, my sister did say to me, she said, look, I'm trying to keep preemies from going blind, but you can have my lab for half a day. That's it. So uh, we made good use of that, and I, I appreciate her, her time. So sometimes we have to go to different energy levels. We have to go to x-rays, uh, where 
Uh, they're more powerful, uh, and they have a shorter wavelength, so they can penetrate things uh, that we can't with the light. So what I'm going to discuss this evening is what we're doing with optical imaging and what we do with X-ray fluorescence. I have to point out some of these. I, was, I think it was National Geographic or somewhere I was showing some of these images, and they said, it looks like a bomb went off. I said, well, it's a lab. What do you expect? You know, it's a little messy sometimes. Yeah. So this actually started, and my work in this started, back with uh, a manuscript called the Archimedes Palimpsest. Now, a palimpsest is a piece of parchment, a parchment text, that was originally used to, to inscribe uh, some information. In this case, it was the earliest copy of Archimedes' work, sphere and cylinders on floating bodies, many of these, you know, uh, eureka out of the bathtub, uh, laws of displacement, that type of thing. So it was known to be a palimpsest, and it was purchased at auction by a private individual for $2.2 million. And uh, he then brought it up to the Walters Art Museum to see uh, if they could do anything. One, for con conservation. It was in very bad shape. Uh, and two, was to see if uh, there was a way of revealing the undertext. So Abigail Quant who's a master, a, a, a tremendous conservator, uh, had the responsibility of taking this apart. And it was bound not only with high glue, but with PVCA glue, Elmer's glue. Uh, so uh, it, was, it was a tough job for her, and it was very badly damaged by, by mold. Well, uh, Will and Abigail were trying to figure out how to read this undertext. And I said, hey, you know, maybe I could help you. I just wrote out of the blue. Turns out I couldn't with the government at the time, which I was thinking, but I became volunteer program manager for that project. Uh, and I said early on in the project, I said, look, 10 years after the day it was auctioned, we will have all the data up online. So we worked with scholars, we worked with imagers, some of the scholars, this is early on in digital times, so you can see, you know, we've used the world's most advanced digitization at the time, a five mega, a six megapixel camera, okay? Most of your cell phones now have 12. Um, and, uh, and you can see how the scholars are experiencing this digital output. We would print it out and give it to the scholars because they did not, it wasn't, I mean, we could get it to them digitally, but they didn't have the facility at that point to really look at it on the screen and, and study it. So we did get all the data out there uh, within 10 years. Uh, actually, we had eight hours to spare. It was purchased on uh, <laughs> October 22nd, 1998 at 2 in the afternoon, and we got all the data up on October 22nd, 2008 at 6 in the morning. So, hey, we beat the deadline, you know, <laughs> within schedule and within budget. So uh, what we did is, uh, and in part working with the owner, uh, was to make sure we just put all the data up there uh, as these flat files. He said, hey, look, if you try to develop a website, it's going to be obsolete in three to five years or so. So just get all the data out there. So that's what we did. We got all the data out there and included the transcriptions by Reveal Nets over on, on the side here, uh, by Reveal Nets and, and Nigel Wilson of that undertext. And it proved to be a, a, an invaluable manuscript. It had not only the Archimedes, but it also had, an, remember, this is a palimpsest. So what they did is they took uh, pieces of parchment that happened to have this Archimedes text. They would scrape off the original text, tear it in half, turn it 90 degrees, and write over it. Well, they had a whole stack of parchment. They must have had a very rich library because they had the Archimedes. They had commentaries on Aristotle. They had Hyperides, uh, which is uh, uh, pretty much an unknown classical text. And we, I think, expanded the amount of Hyperides text by 100%. Uh, so it was a very rich trove. And so it was the Archimedes palimpsest, but it contained all of these other texts, which is a challenge for, with working with palimpsests. You don't know what's really there as you get into it. So we got uh, what back then, you know, 2.4 giga data. Wow, that was a lot of data. And uh, we got all of that up online. 
And uh, you can, it's now hosted by University of Pennsylvania on what they call OPEN, a play on open data. And uh, you can get the Archimedes Polymcist and some others there. We were talking about metadata and what sounds like the world's most boring job. Uh, but it's a critical job. And I think Will Knoll put it best in his book that he wrote with Revial Nets, uh, The Archimedes Codex. You can still buy, buy a used one. And in the inscription to Doug Emery, who I brought from Accenture to be our data manager on that, to Doug Emery, whose critical contribution to the project goes unrecorded in this book. Sorry, metadata doesn't sell. Thank you so much, Will Knoll. And unfortunately, uh, this is all too true. Not only does metadata not sell, but sometimes we don't consider that. We tend to focus on the technology and on the sexy technology and those, those big x-rays and the, and the camera with, uh, you know, we're now up to 100 or 150 megapixel. But it really comes down to what are you going to do with that data and to plan for that and to consider that. And we were so fortunate to have Doug Emery uh, come and join us. And he is now working for University of Pennsylvania uh, on uh, data management. And we're hoping to get him out to Himmel at some point uh, to, for discussions here on sharing data, on broadening the access to data. Another person we worked with, uh, there was a whole team of, of scientists, was Dr. Bill Christians Berry. Uh, and Bill developed what back then were the kind of the family size pizza box lights. Um, we had three advances going on during the course of the Archimedes Palimpsest. One was the advances of digital collection with digital cameras. Uh, two were the uh, advances in LED lighting. Uh, and three was the ability to move those data around and to, uh, to share it uh, and to store the data. So Bill developed a method of narrow band illumination, meaning these bright white lights are actually, if we put it through a prism, kind of like the dark side of the moon cover for those of us of that era, um, where you get a rainbow of color coming out. Uh, and so if we work in a dark room and we illuminate with, say, red light, uh, the down to orange, yellow on from the, the longer wavelengths to the shorter wavelengths down to the greens and blues, uh, you can get different responses from the inks. Uh, and if you add in some that we cannot see, such as the infrared or the ultraviolet at both ends of the spectrum there, then you get even more information. So Bill developed these, these panels using advances in LEDs, cool light, uh, and we could, we could make sure we get in the right wavelengths. And so what we could do is, and this is a piece of papyrus, uh, at the University of Manchester, John Ryland's library. And so we click through the different colors of lights. And I don't, when we first did this, we would actually click through. Now we have computer software to, to do that, and it's much quicker. And you get different responses from the object. You can see how, how some of the, the papyrus responds differently to the different colors of light. And we're working from the ultraviolet that we cannot see with the human eye through what we can see with the human eye, at least many of us can see. And something we always have to keep in mind, especially when dealing with male scholars, in one out of 10, one out of 12 of them, probably cannot see this. Uh, and so then we have to work in a grayscale. And I actually have a colorblind test on my phone. I'll frequently give a scholar and, and uh, we'll see uh, what works best for them. So we capture, we're in a dark room, we have a camera, we have lights, and we have the object, and we go through all these sequences of illumination. For those of you uh, into the technology, this is the, the type of camera we use, really big. So we end up with a stack of images in all the different colors. Usually we use a black and white camera. This is with a color filter just so you can see the different colors and how they're captured of a manuscript that's you know, held down with these, these little fingers here to make sure it stays flat, which it never does. So uh, then from, um, from the Archimedes Palimpsest, uh, we worked with, uh, with St. Catherine's Monastery, uh, the same team 
out in the middle of the Sinai Desert there. Uh, and uh, it was, uh, we started there in 2009 uh, with e experimental imaging there uh, and uh, working with uh, Father Justin, uh, who is the librarian uh, at St. Catherine's Monastery. I don't know what it is about the water in Texas, but that former Southern Baptist from Texas is now a monk in, in St. Catherine's Monastery. So, uh, you know, it must be something about Texans and these manuscripts and preserving them and making them available. Uh, and wonderful to work with. So we had uh, this team there. Uh, it is, you know, like Collegeville, it's very serene. Uh, it does have, well, I was going to say it has worse, some worse political problems, but we shall see. And, uh, and uh, it's a bit more ornate, but uh, they follow similar rules. And the prayer is in Greek. And uh, there's, you know, there's incense and that type of thing, but it, there's still that, uh, that veneration and, and worship that goes on there, which does interrupt your imaging day. So uh, they have a, uh, the library tradition goes on for about 200 years, but they have been uh, storing and preserving manuscripts uh, since uh, about 400, in, in the fifth century. So uh, one of the four oldest libraries in the Western world. This, uh, someone was commenting they now have a new library uh, despite the revolutions uh, and that they just opened uh, for, that better preserves the manuscripts. This is the library as we were there. Uh, as you can see in their original bindings, this, if you will, benign neglect preserved these beautifully. It's a bit dry. It's about 17% humidity. Father Justin used to run around behind the previous library and picking up the pieces of the manuscripts that would fall off onto the ground. They're like, like dried papadums or potato chips. But no mold. You have uh, less risk of fire, too. And just keeping them stored in this dry environment uh, helped preserve these manuscripts. So uh, we would uh, position these under uh, some advanced cameras, use the same narrow band uh, that uh, Bill Christiansberry developed. Uh, smaller lights now at this point. Uh, we had uh, Greeks uh, who would do the day-to-day -day imaging in the dark room, uh, wading through those manuscripts. Took close collaboration with the community there, including the archbishop uh, and the other monks there. And what we would get, this is just an example, this is uh, Greek new finds, uh, majuscule Greek too. And the reason these are called the new finds is in 1975 they had a fire over by one section of the wall. And that kind of brought to the fore this opening in the wall where there were all these old manuscripts in the opening. And they call them the new finds. They sort of knew they were there but hadn't really paid them much attention. Uh, and so it was kind of a, almost like a Geniza, because these are the old, old pieces of manuscripts that perhaps had come off or been damaged. And so they would put them in baskets uh, in the wall there. So uh, this one uh, is unique in that it has, um, I, I believe it's the letters of Paul, it's in Greek and in Arabic. Christ, I mean, this is, this is Christian readings, but in Arabic there. So this is what it looks like, and you can see the iron gall ink that's been scrubbed off underneath. This runs parallel. Frequently it'll run perpendicular. Uh, and then with the advanced imaging and the processing, as with many palimpsests, this contained all these different manuscripts there, and I won't, won't go through them all. Uh, but so you have this combination of, of different undertexts there that make up the manuscript. So this is, this is Doug Emery, uh, the data manager that we brought over for the Sinai Palmsis project, and Susan Marshall. And they are the unsung heroes of this project. And we all talk about the science and we talk about the scholarship. But it's their work on kind of a shoestring uh, that this is in Susan's house in California, uh, working with all these hard drives, just moving these hard drives around, and we would just send them around by FedEx. It's got high latency but huge throughput. So, uh, you know, it worked pretty well to get the data to the scientists, to the scholars, and they had to manage all of these data and to, uh, to make sure it got out to the scholars, it got to the scientists, it got back, and it finally got uploaded uh, 
uh, in, uh, in the UCLA, and I'll, I'll discuss that further. One of the books, for example, is uh, what we call uh, the Codex Syriacus. Uh, this is the Sisters of the Sinai. You may have read the book. Uh, they uh, worked on early uh, translations of the undertext there. They used a chemical reagent on it that allowed them to read it for a short period of time, and then it turned black. So had to work with that as well. So this is what it looks like. And now all of these data are at UCLA on the Sinai Palimpsest's uh, uh, research site. You can register for it. And this is, this is this book in digital form. And you can see the different undertexts all part of Syriac 30 there. Uh, so you can go to the sinai.library.ucla.edu to see those. Now, since then, we've developed portable equipment. Uh, we, we carried it in planes, trains, and automobiles. It weighs, about, it weighs about 50 pounds, and I have to try to make it look like it's 15 pounds. So, uh, you know, I'm just kind of you know, like this. Um, uh, and uh, now that we're in Venice, we also boats too. So we've, uh, we've carried it. it. It is fairly portable. Um, and so that's what it looks like. We have the standard foot there, so you can tell the size. <laughs> And, uh, and uh, you know, we, we take it out and set it up, and away we go, and we start imaging. This was uh, in, uh, in Vienna in the Austrian National Library where we were actually doing some, some work for Melissa and others there. It was kind of roundabout en route from Venice. You go to Vienna, and we stopped in Verona, too, because it starts with a V, you know. So, uh, <clears throat> so we ended up with these, you know, with these stacks of images here. Again, I'm just showing you the color here. Every now and then you get something on the lens, you got to, you know, something weird shows up there, you know. So, um, let's see, what was this? Oh, okay. And um, one of the things with this camera system, it's very, very, very sensitive. And I was down at the Houston Museum of Fine Arts, and we collect a calibration sample. We have a big, we have a thick piece of Epson ultrafine paper, and we put it down, and we just get a picture of a white piece of paper. So we got the picture of the white piece of paper, and I wasn't paying attention, so one of the, the conservatives threw it down there, and you know, I look at it, I don't know if you can see it from there, but there's a pattern here. And what had happened, the guy says, oh, I didn't think about it. He had left the color chart underneath the white piece of paper. So I said, okay, uh, we redid it, but then you could process that stack of monochrome images and see through it, really. Uh, and we've used that to good purpose, and I'll cite some examples of it. So not only can we see what's been scrubbed off, but we can see what has been, has something on top of it. So we've worked in, and I, I focus more on, on some of the religious texts, um, or in, in religious areas. We, of course, worked in the Vatican with the uh, Bibliotheca Apostolica Vaticana, and uh, wonderful people to work with. And so we'd set up in the Bernini Salon there, you know, big, beautiful salon, and uh, which uh, I must say the Vatican has good connectivity in many ways, but we also had, had good connectivity. But, as we go into the salon there, there's these beautiful wood inlaid doors. And I always said this picture of, of John the Baptist with his head on a platter was a warning to me of, you know, if, if we didn't get what we were supposed to, you know, this, this, is, uh, this is a warning. So this was kind of a quid pro quo thing that we were brought into the Vatican um, just as, you know, they had helped out with something and so we were going to help them out. So, well, what do you have? Well, they bring out this piece of, well, a couple of these pieces of parchment that look like this. So what had happened, uh, this is rare commentary on the Lemayan Wars. So this is rare commentary on the end of Alexander's reign in Greece. Um, and we don't know much about that period. It was very important. So Cardinal Librarian May used a reagent on this to try to reveal what was underneath. Well, after about 15, 20 minutes, it turned black. So they give us these black things and said, here, see what you can do. I said, gee, thank you very much. So uh, we then uh, imaged these, and um, we were able to, uh, you know, we started to get some undertext there. And 
Ultimately, with the imaging and the image processing, we were able to bring that out. Uh, and when I say we, it was really, a lot of it was the work of Bill Christians Barry. Because uh, I was there with Alberto Campagnolo, we would image during the day, uh, and then, in fact, it was one, on, when we were first there and I sent some stuff off to Bill, I went out for fine Italian food and wine, and Bill, who's six hours behind me, starts the image processing, he sends it back, we chat in the morning, and the, actually the next morning he says, you know, Mike, I'm not seeing anything. I see the overtext, but I'm not seeing the undertext. So I go in, you know, kind of tail between my legs, saying, you know, this is all we got. They say, oh, this is wonderful. The overtext is that black smear. It's the undertext that you're seeing here. I said, phew, I got that one. So we were able to reveal that, which is a lot better than that. So, uh, but those are the types of challenges we faced. The scholars were really excited about it. Uh, we had good feedback while we were there. Uh, so we'd be, uh, you know, bringing up the images. They'd say, oh, look at this, look at that, which helps verify what we're doing while we're there. And then uh, we, we ended up dosing it up with a lot of light to get through that, that black uh, reagent there. But we added 20 to our, not we added, our work contributed to the scholars adding 22 lines of text here. So uh, I wanted to give you kind of a quick overview of moving from Christian texts, and, and just as Himmel is working with Islamic texts now, give you a quick overview of what we've done with a, a Quran at the University of Birmingham. And they produced a short uh, video on this, so I thought I'd share it with you and uh, you could get a, a better feel of what we're like soup to nuts here. So we'll see. Multispectral imaging is when one uses the different wavelengths of light to try to reveal residues and texts and anything that's in an object that's not seen by the naked eye. We use light starting in the ultraviolet through the visible, the red, green, blue, on up to the infrared. And then we combine those images, that stack of images, to better show things that are in the object that you cannot see. I think in this image here. One of the strengths of multispectral imaging is to be able to see whether or not there is text underneath the text that we see with the naked eye. We have used multispectral imaging to try to reveal texts that have been scraped off and overwritten. In other words, a palimpsest. To date, we have seen no evidence of any other inks or texts underneath the text that is currently visible on the Birmingham Quran. So there in a minute and a half, but it took me 30 minutes to explain to you. So, it was those last, that last line, to date we have seen no evidence of undertext in the Birmingham Quran. And this is, was a difficult project because we were brought out there to prove, to try to prove the negative. That what's cited as the earliest copy of the Quran had not, was not a palimpsest because they had used carbon-14 dating on the parchment to date it. So how do you know that that was actually when that overtext was put on there? So we set up our gear there, uh, and uh, mind you, we, we put the gloves on for the pictures. We do not handle these things with gloves usually. Uh, did the usual stack of images. Uh, we used an advanced camera, 100 megapixel, and this is what we would get. And what we ended up doing is we mirrored the, the uh, recto and verso, and what people were saying, oh, this is under text, was really a uh, show through of the verso. Uh, but it was a wonderful opportunity, and we collected a, a large amount of data on this and other texts, which Birmingham now has, that gives them more information about what is cited as the earliest copy of the Quran. So 
We now have uh, an integrated imaging system with the software and the hardware, and there's some institutions that have these. This is at the uh, Royal Library of Belgium, uh, and uh, where you know they have a have a permanent system there. But one of the applications that that kind of brought me close to Himmel here was the Syriac or is the Syriac Galen Palimpsest. Uh, and the, the same individual who owns the Archimedes Palimpsest owns the Syriac Galen Palimpsest. And he said, well, maybe you guys want to try on this one. So we, uh, we imaged that. Uh, this is what it looks like in its book. It was uh, disbound. Uh, we did some preliminary imaging. Uh, and we didn't know exactly what it was. And so from this preliminary imaging, um, the CM Bayro and Sebastian Brock were able to identify uh, this uh, information that it was on uh, Galen's on simple drugs, which is an early, uh, David can explain more, but is an early medical text by this, this uh, Greek philosopher that through the Syriac uh, language is being transmitted uh, to, to the world. So this is a, a unique text and very important. So we, we, it was disbound by, Ab or by, a, by a team of conservatives uh, under Abigail, uh, and we, we imaged it all, and uh, we got you know, uh, good information. And uh, we put it out there, made it freely available, and I thought, oh, great, you know, project's done. All right, it's all out there. Well, then there's a team of, of scholars out in, uh, in Paris who were uh, studying it, uh, looking at the use of herbals in ancient medicine. So, so, so I swung through Paris on one of my trips and kind of helped him, point him in the right direction. And same within Manchester, and this is uh, Gregory Kessel, uh, who I had first gotten to meet uh, through this. Uh, and so they started, started studying this just because it's out there and, and it's available. And it's not part of the project's done, the program's done, you know, but they're off, off studying this. And then I brought, just as, as I brought Father Columba to the library to see this, uh, before Father Columba was there, I brought Gregory Kessel by. He was studying, studying at Dunbar, and I said, hey, why don't you, let's, let's arrange with the owner so you can actually see and handle the manuscript. And he sits down at the, the owner's table, and he says, I feel like I've held this before. And he brought up on his screen there a leaf of Syriac text that was in the Houghton Library at Harvard. And he said, this leaf, this leaf on my, my screen here that he had taken the, the picture of, uh, is from this palimpsest. And thus started the hunt for the missing leaves. And uh, so we went up to, uh, to the Houghton, and we imaged that, and we collected those data. Uh, and then he found one of the leaves in St. Catherine's Monastery was, or is, from the Syriac Galen Palmsus. So we imaged that as part of the St. Catherine's Monastery project. And then, uh, so we you know, put it, ran it through the cycle there. In the Vatican, there's three leaves there. Uh, actually, uh, two of them they thought was a bifolium. They're actually separate leaves. And so this is all Grigory's research, just, just looking through the catalogs uh, to say, hey, I think from this catalog entry, this could be it. And he was right. He's an amazing individual in his ability to you know, discern key bits of info, little bits of information that prove critical. So, uh, and then at the BNF, uh, Bibliothèque Nationale de France in Paris, and so we, we imaged that. This is what a whole stack of images would look like, the, the monochrome images. And uh, we finished, so we thought, we finished the spectral imaging, we processed it, showed the undertext. We're done, okay? All done. Hosted these additional data, so we, we put this all up on OPAN, on digitalgalen.net, and now we have the, the BNF data, the Houghton data, the Sinai data, and the Vatican data. So we have now digitally reunited this palimpsest, uh, and uh, including you know, the private stuff. So it's, it's all up there online. And one of the things they found on the Vatican leaf, there's this uh, Arabic uh, inscription there, you can, up at the top, which says, says this which is consigned to the monks of Mount Sinai. No one has the authority to take it away from them. So 
they are left now with this one leaf and the rest had been distributed at, at some point in time. So, but now it's all freely available online. So you never know what's gonna happen with the data. And I, re I really love this manuscript in particular because it's taken on a life of its own. Some scholars and some scientists, uh, especially over at John Ryland's library in Manchester, uh, they, they kind of glommed onto this. And they got a, a large grant in the UK to study this. Uh, and uh, we had a, a meeting of the whole team on this. And, uh, uh, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a number of, of people who've been working on this over the years. Uh, this made the New York Times and the science section, you know, when does uh, Syriac and, and uh, ancient metal t medical texts make the science section of the New York Times. Uh, and as Peter Foreman said, uh, you know, we might discover things we really can't dream of yet. And so this took on a life of its own. And I have to back up a little bit, because when we were working with the Archimedes Palimpsest, there's four forgeries there, and there's a colophon on it, that we just could not read with optical imaging. There's gold paint on top of the forgeries. This is what one of the forgeries looked like. So long story short, we took it out to the Stanford Synchrotron Light Source, uh, we used X-ray fluorescence, and we were able to reveal uh, the overtext and the undertext under this forgery. So we said, hey, this worked pretty well. This methodology worked well for the Archimedes. So how about the Syriac Galen Palimpsest? So we went to the owner's library. This is Dr. Uwe Bergman. Uh, who is a, an X-ray physicist, and we've been working with him since the time of the Archimedes Palimpsest. And uh, we got, we had loaned to us a handheld Bruker uh, XRF analyzer. Uh, and with that, we could see what element, uh, what elemental response we're getting. And what we're looking for is a big iron spike, because we're using, I or not we, the scribes used iron gall ink. And that's how we were able to read the Archimedes, because this iron really fluoresces well. You, you fire a high-powered X-ray at it, and it sends off a weak X-ray signal at a certain energy level. So we, uh, you know, we, it, it's a, bit of a learning curve because you've got to keep your hands and feet away from underneath this thing because it is x-ray. This is very low power. This is very low power though. So what we found is this is going to be really hard because <laughs> <clears throat> this is the energy level for iron. Okay, we're supposed to be getting energy at 6.405. Very, very low. Calcium is really high. Now, when we're looking at this with optical, we're looking at everything, okay? So we couldn't break out the iron from the calcium. But when we have a sensitive enough detector and a, and a bright enough, a, a powerful enough X-ray source, we could see the iron. So this, you know, the imaging's all completed, not quite. So it had been rebound, the book had been rebound, and the owner, you know, was so gracious, you know, I had, had to go and say, you know that book that you spent all the money rebuying? Can we just bind it? And uh, he, ag he agreed to have it disbound. And uh, that's what the binding looks like with all those threads cut. And so we've had advances in technology. Okay, we've got advanced camera systems now since we use the old 30, 36 megapixel camera. We're now using 100 megapixel camera. So we re-imaged many of the leaves. The scholars said, here's our priority list. We can't even identify these leaves. These leaves we can, can't read, and these we'd kind of like to know about. So we would use multispectral imaging, but we also then set it up uh, so we use, you know, new cameras, uh, new lights, that type of thing. And this is the type of response we got with the undertext. You can see faintly under there, the overtext is the suppressed uh, large, large text there. Uh, or for some of you men, uh, this is what it looks like. So what we did is we took it to Stanford at the same time. We did the imaging out of thanks to the generosity of the Stanford uh, Conservation Lab and Stanford Library, where they gave us space and we worked in there. So we would take uh, these leaves, mount them in front of an X-ray beam. Let me see what the, we had the team. This is uh, Peter Poorman, the scholar, Uwe Bergman and Bill Sellers, uh, who worked on actually seeing the objects 
big team there at Stanford, and this is what we would get. Uh, by scanning this, like taking a human hair, a 50 micron, 50 to 100 mic micron beam going back and forth. It would take 10 hours a side. I'd be getting up in the middle of the night to swap them out. But we got more information for the scholars. This, these are the data we got. We would convert them to TIFF files. So now we have, you know, here's what you see in natural light. Here's what you'd see with multispectral. And then with the X-ray fluorescence, you could see more there. So we just, for this uh, and for a conference we have coming up, we've now hosted all of those additional data, the XRF data and the 100 megapixel data, so you can access that. So you go in there and you get that type of files. We are also using machine learning, applying artificial intelligence to teach the system to recognize the undertext. So this is kind of pushing the envelope for technology. This is what Bill Sellers is doing. So that brings us here. That brings us to Himmel. And it brings us to perhaps one of the few uh, pieces of apolemsis that Himmel has that could be significant. Uh, so it's uh, uh, SJU uh, Manuscript Fragment 32. Uh, and I don't know if it was over dinner or whatever, but Father Colum and I are talking. He says, yeah, I think we've got a apolemsis. So he sends it on down, and we were testing in our lab, and, and so we, we, uh, we imaged it with multispectral imaging. Uh, this was the stack of images. Uh, and then we use, and I won't go into the digital processing, we have tools that allow you to, to process it fairly simple. Uh, and we got some decent results. You can see this is the undertext in the lighter yellow here, and the green is the, the overtext there. Um, here's a little better if we turn it around so it's right side up, you can read it a little better. Uh, so, um, but you can see there's still significant issues in, in, well, actually in this area. So we sent it off, uh, and David uh, was good enough to, to review this here at Himmel. Uh, and then he came back to us, he said, you know, I'd really like to read these, this area, this area, this area, this area, and this area. I said, okay, let's give it a try. We've done what we can in collecting it, so what can we do for processing to help his eyes see this? So we tried, you know, one afternoon I sat down at the computer and let's try this, let's try this. And, you know, this is really, this is really faint here. And, and it's, it's not for lack of focus. It's for, it's so well scrubbed off and there's so much calcium on it. Let's try this, try this, try this, try this. So we, we did all of these images. We said, hey, we are up against those darn laws of physics. You know, they always get in the way. So, you know, that's what we can do optically. So we may have to turn to another energy level. So what we're talking about is using, and I've, I've talked with Uwe just before I came out here, we were talking with Uwe and we were trying to get some beam time so that we could take this out to Stanford, put it in just as we did with Syriac and Polymsis. I brought the templates with me so we can fit it into the frame. So stay tuned. You know, at your next meeting, maybe you'll have some more information there. I should point out that um, there's some costs in terms of the logistics of getting it out there, but you're basically using a multi-billion dollar piece of kit through our tax dollars from Department of Energy. So we're and able to capitalize on, on, on that. So uh, you also have a musical palimpsest, uh, which was an antiphonal, uh, so we imaged that. Uh, this is what it looked like, and uh, this is the undertext, which has in the dark is the undertext, the music, or the undernotes. Uh, just like we had David do the Syriac, we had a musician sit down with it and uh, see what it, it sounded like there. Um, and in, in closing, I wanted to come to perhaps you know, one of the, or the seminal piece of religious text, and this is the Codex Sinaiticus. And one of the leaves of Codex Sinaiticus, it was, it was loaned, by, loaned by the monastery to uh, Baron uh, Tischendorf, uh, who subsequently gave it to the Tsar and then sold it to the British Library. Uh, there is this one leaf still in St. Catherine's Monastery. They'd like the others back. Thank you very much. But while we were imaging, uh, in St. Catherine's Monastery, um, 
Father Justin brought out this manuscript that has a binding on it. And if you look closely at the binding, you can see some text here underneath the paper that looks very familiar. And so we were able to image that and to show the text of the Codex Sinaiticus underneath. Now, this is with an early camera system. Uh, and, you know, this is, this is important text, and, and it gives indication of, you know, we don't know what else is out there. We don't know what, what else, you know, in these libraries there. Uh, you know, the, the importance of Himmel to preserve and to share uh, is known far and wide. Uh, and, you know, new technology may make a contribution. We've talked about, you know, we've talked about x-rays. We've talked about spectral imaging. But what it really comes down to are the people and the work processes. We've talked about the importance of the metadata. Uh, we tend to get caught up in, oh, those bright blinky lights and, uh, and all the training you need to work with radiation. But it doesn't do you any good if you don't have good catalogers, if you don't have good metadata, if you don't have good IT people to share those, if you don't have good scholars to help you catalog and understand what you have. So as you look at what you are doing for Himmel and what Himmel is doing for the world and for the community, I can't emphasize enough that it really comes down to the people and to the processes they are putting into place. You can have all the best technology in the world, but you need the people. We need people like you and organizations like Arcadia and Mellon and NEH and Whiting to advance these, uh, this opportunity to preserve uh, and to, to uh, share. Uh, our data for future generations. So thank you very much. Sure. Yeah. Do you want to use the mic or uh, questions or comments? Or so we can ideas? take a couple questions. So please uh, feel free. And Mike, I'll let you handle okay. questions. Okay. No, everyone wants dessert. Yes, sir. Are there any other Quran documents that suggest possibilities? That gets, uh, the question is, are there any other Quran documents that uh, offer possibilities? Um, and I think there was one, I think it was a uh, Quranic text, or Quran over Coptic Christian, and uh, that just went up for auction for a large sum of money. And I always find anything that's really dramatic you got to look at it really closely, a little fishy. Uh, but it, it, it opens up some sensitivities, too. Uh, and, you know, the, the um, I'm not a religious scholar, but Quran is an important text. Uh, and uh, you usually wouldn't find it, you know, overwritten. Uh, if you did, you probably just want to leave it well enough alone. Yeah. So. Other questions? Yes, sir, in the back. No, the question is, did we go to gamma rays? We used just x-rays. Uh, we used um, uh, hard x-rays, uh, so they're at an energy level uh, that does not dissipate in the atmosphere, which the soft x-rays would. So we needed the lead line hutches and all the safety gear and everything. So, uh, so you just keep on Yes, um, Will Knoll has said you want the worst possible image to meet the scholar's needs, because there's cost every time you, you increase your quality. Uh, so you start with really good digitization. What you can't get with that, you then may turn to multispectral, which is portable and, and easier to use. Then, and only then, and that's exactly what we're doing here with uh, fragment, uh, fragment 32, is you know, we've tried, you've got really good digital, we've tried multispectral, we're not getting anything there. We're pushing the limits. So, okay, let's then go to XRF. But you don't immediately jump to that uh, because it is a resource-intensive uh, collection capability. So, yes, ma'am. Yes, I'm more interested uh, in not the technical but the social aspects of this, and particularly with private collectors, which you mentioned. Some of these were owned by private collectors, and some are coming up for auction. How does that work? 
I mean, are private collectors an important part of this resource? Why aren't all these things in scholarly collections or libraries? Can you talk about that a little bit, about the role of private collectors? So the question is the role of private collectors in many of these manuscripts. And as I cited, the Archimedes and Galen Palmsists are privately held. And the answer is really, it depends on the private collector. You know, there's, there's some cases, there's some cases in the art world where it, it just disappears. But then there's some cases, you know, the Archimedes and Galen Palimpsest, I dare say, unless it had wound up at Himmel, I don't know if Himmel wants to spend $2.2 .2 million on one, and another, I don't know how much on the other. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so here's, you know, here's someone who has the resources to acquire it. And fortunately, it went to this individual because his goal was to make them freely available. Uh, and he had some ideas on how to ensure preservation in terms of keeping them flat files. And there's some institutions, I mean, you're, you're coming from a perspective of an institution where the goal is to share and to preserve. I mean, that is your ultimate goal. There are some institutions where, okay, you want this? Okay, it's gonna cost you this much and you're limited in how you can use it in terms of access or attribution or, or whatever. So it's, you know, it tends to be, oh, private collectors, oh, you know, uh, public institutions, but it's, it's a very gray area. So it depends on the public institution, it depends on the private collector. You're spoiled with Himmel here, we are all spoiled with Himmel, with preserve and share, yeah. Another question? One more. Okay, let me go over to the side, sorry, and, and we'll, we'll chat. Uh, I will be around for dessert. I do want to get some dessert, though, sorry. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, there's a lot of exciting things about the work. What do you find personally most exciting about it? Discovery. And discovery not just of what we're finding there. In fact, sometimes these things are just going so fast and furious that it's kind of afterwards you go, oh, yeah, that was a, that was a Durer or that was a Rubens or whatever. Um, it's really discovery in terms of, of, of the creativity of a team, of pulling everything together, of you know, scientists, scholars, engineers, data managers, and what can we do? So I, I guess it's really kind of the building and discovery there. And so, and I'm, I'm so excited to be here because, you know, you've got such a wonderful team here. Very, very small team, you know, high quality, uh, low, low, low number of people. And, uh, you know, just in our discussions yesterday and today, you know, all sorts of ideas bouncing all over. Now, now you know, many of these will be, well, no, we really can't, but, you know, to be able to move forward, whether I play a role in it or not, but for, you know, seeing what Himmel can do, and then ideas that I get in terms of what we can do, you know, across the board in terms of preserve and share. So, uh, so there's that, that sense of, of, you know, what are you, what are you finding and, and what are you taking forward? So. so Mike, thank you so much. Thank you.